Welcome to our seventh webinar, which is recalls and returns for hemp and CBD. Eight things you didn't know, but I bet we'll have a whole lot more than eight things you didn't know today. And I want to get started to introduce our guests. We've got Kim and Sheila with us again, and we're welcoming them back. They actually were with us last month and did a spectacular job. We talked a little bit about GMPs and what that process takes and looks like to get GMP certified. And it was pretty cool. We started to dive in, one of the topics being recalls and returns, and they hinted at some pretty crazy stories. And I thought, wow, this is a really interesting and important topic. And one of those things and or landmines that can put uh, a CBD or hemp company out of business if we're not prepared. And so we talked a little more and they were kind enough to join us again. So Kim and Sheila, thank you so much for joining us today. And and Kim, can you tell us a little bit about how LA got started and how you and I, you and Sheila, you know, met each other? Yeah, definitely. Um, I actually used to work for DDPHE and so did Sheila. So um, we had previous work experience together. Um, we were both cannabis regulators um, in the city and county of Denver. Um, it was really an amazing opportunity to learn a lot about the industry. Um, we became certified professionals of food safety and certified quality auditors at that time. Um, removed a whole lot of cannabis from um, the shelves uh, simply because of contamination. So we both have been through a whole lot of recalls um, and have, you know, really now we help companies kind of navigate that now. So um, I decided to leave the city and um, started a lay in 2017. And then uh, a couple of years later, Sheila actually um, joined me. So yeah, it was really great. Awesome. So we have a lot to cover today, which is some pretty crazy stories along with some tips um, to help us prevent, prepare and execute a recall and return. And so before we get started and start covering that, I want to do a quick poll. Let me go ahead and launch a poll. And which is at this stage, um, how concerned are you about recalls and returns for you or your business? And if you don't own a business, let's say maybe um, it's your client, if you're a law firm or insurance firm, how concerned would you be for your clients? I will give you guys a second on that. All right, let me show the ratings for this. Right now, we're at um, on a scale of one to five, five being really concerned and one not being concerned at all. We're at about a 3.8. So it seems to be something that's pretty, pretty important to everybody. And on that, let's talk a little about what some of the facts are. So, Kim, oftentimes we look at recalls as with anything that could be, you know, significantly problematic. We're just like, man, I just hope it doesn't happen to me. Right. So you've had a chance to see the impact some of these recalls have had on different businesses. Tell us what a recall can do to a company in this industry. Yeah. So um, when I, I was working for the city, um, like I said, we did a whole lot of recalls. Me and Sheila were very involved in that process. And um, hopefully we can you know, get some of that information to you guys today. So um, thank you for having us again. Um, we were, I, I would say in 2016 alone, um, I actually started to keep a tab, like a tally of how much, because there, there isn't really any good data being kept by regulatory um, agencies at this point, talking about how much it actually costs. Um, so my disposals alone in 2016 ended up being around $28 million. Wow. Um, just for the county of Denver, because that was my jurisdiction. Um, so we really didn't get, um, you know, solid data. I was the only person that was keeping just what I was disposing of. Um, and, you know, there were a number of recalls that year, a lot, actually. Um, and so that just gives you a good idea. Um, I think the biggest rec or, um, disposal I ever did was a 4.2 million in one day. Um, and that was where, you know, we showed up with a wood chipper essentially um, to the facility and then, um, you know, destroyed essentially an entire crop. And then that also included a lot of concentrates and edibles and things like that um, that were um, included. So that was a really huge one, obviously. Um, but with these recalls, one of the things um, that 
happens is it's not just the the government agency doesn't just come on site and destroy all your stuff. They also put out a press release and they, you know, usually it's in the paper. Um, and I think that that's the damage that we can't really account for. I can't tell you how many, you know, people, customers were like, oh God, I'm never buying that product again. Um, right. It takes your actual company. That makes you look really, really bad. Um, obviously, all wholesale food manufacturers have gone through a recall at some point. It is part of making a product. But when it's something like, oh, our flour company that we buy our flour from accidentally had some peanuts in their facility. So we had to do a voluntary recall to, you know, get that back or, you know, that kind of thing. That's different than, hey, we had contaminated product mm -hmm. and we sold it to the public knowing it was contaminated. So um, we even had people who are in jail now, you know, in prison because they sold contaminated product um, without, you know, knowingly um, and to the public. So realize that, you know, there are a lot of consequences um, to that. So not only can you, you know, have jail time, um, but you can also, you know, your entire company has that reputation now. So, you know, we, we it's really hard to tell you exactly how much it would affect someone, but it does affect them a whole lot and not just the amount that, um, you know, they dispose of. So, you know, you are one regulator in one county doing $28 million of, of recalls. So it's hard to say what the, and this is one industry, right? Cannabis, hemp, CBD. It's hard to say what that, that number would be nationally, but um, I, I'd have to imagine it's, it's, it's pretty big. And so I think a lot of times companies say, oh, well, you know, maybe I'll just get a fine, you know, $1,500. What's the big deal? But to your point, like having to recall and destroy your product is significant. And I think you, you mentioned that, you know, we may get into a little bit later about how this puts companies out of business, but you know, your reputation, you only have one, right? And that's something that you can take years to build and, and can be gone in, in a couple minutes. So, you know, I'd love to, to look a little further about like why this happens. So Sheila, talk a little bit about, you know, some of the key reasons that happened and, and what you think, that, you know, is the highest risk of these and what did you see most frequently? Uh, yeah, definitely. Well, thank you for having me once again. And, and so right now I'm going to talk to you guys about recalls that have happened in the industry and like the reasoning for those recalls. Um, it's not always the same from industry to industry. And so cannabis is a unique industry and there is differences when it comes to recalls. So one of the main recalls um, that we experienced or that we were a part of is unapproved pesticides. And the reasoning why this was such a big um, issue and caused so many recalls is there's a huge difference when it comes to pesticides for food versus for cannabis. Now, you can have a pesticide that you can put on food very easily and it be not harmful to the general public in certain doses. However, when you put that on a cannabis product that could potentially be inhaled, um, that pesticide has different effects and it may no longer be safe to put on that product. So it's important to know what type of pesticides you can use um, on cannabis products um, to prevent a recall. Now, it's important to make sure that you are in contact with your Department of Agriculture to let or to communicate with them as to what pesticides those are. Elevated yeast and mold is another reason why there's been recalls in the cannabis industry. And now this can go down to how you're handling the plants, how you're curing the plants. If there's a lot of water content that's resi or residing in that plant, it's going to be a perfect environment for yeast and molds to grow. And at certain levels, it may be okay, but once it gets really elevated, that could be very dangerous to consume or inhale. Other recalls have been for unapproved ingredients. And so some of those examples are CBD isolate from unlicensed sources. Since this is such a new industry and it's not, you know, regulated federally at a federal level, there are unlicensed facilities that are selling cannabis and CBD products. And so it's important as a manufacturer that if you are purchasing CBD oil or isolate, that it's from a licensed and regulated source. Um, other unapproved ingredient recalls have been from non-consumable ingredients and consumable products. And so on the next slide, we have some really good examples of some of these recalls that can really show you the severity um, and, the, you know, the situation around those recalls. 
Another one is synthetic CBD. And this is something that you don't think about so much in the industry, but it does happen. And there have been recalls because of it. Mm. Other reasons are labeling errors. And I think this is across all um, industries that there's labeling errors that can cause recalls. And some of those can be severe um, with allergens that need to be labeled that are not labeled. And some of those can be not so severe labeling errors. Residual the labeling, Sheila, sorry, sorry to yeah. jump in, but I think in the last couple of days, I've seen the FDA start to smack some hands for CBD companies about claims and some of it having to do with claims regarding COVID-19. So unless we have some sort of deep uh, studies, like I think you can't, we, you know, knowing that we can't make claims and put that on labels, I think is, is really important. Something that'll get us in trouble fast. Absolutely. And you bring up a great, a great point that the FDA has been going out and they've been sending warning letters to a lot of CBD companies about not only COVID-19 claims, but health claims in general. And the FDA has made it very clear that the cannabis industry is not permitted to have any health claims on their products. Right. Um, and by continuing to have those health claims, it could have consequences um, of, you know, from the FDA of recalling your product or even potentially shutting down your operation if you don't conform to um, their requirements. So that's a great point to, to mention. Um, and then, yeah, moving on to residual solvents. So a lot of manufacturing companies during their extraction process or post-processing, they use a lot of solvents such as butane, propane, ethanol. Now those residual salt or those solvents should be removed from the product before it gets into customers' hands. But if the, there is residual solvents remaining, it could be dangerous to consume or even inhale into your lungs. So it's important to be testing for those residual solvents in your final product. Um, questionable ingredients and in vaping products. I think that vaping products were not at the forefront of many regulators' um, radar for a long time. And then in recent times, due to the vaping crisis, it's really became a huge issue. And the vaping crisis really brought to our attention the ingredients in these vape products could cause adverse health adverse health events. Um, there were several people who were getting sick based off of the ingredients in vape pens. And it caused several recalls among many different states. And not only that, but regulations started to change in many states as to what is allowed in vape pens. And so that was a really big one that wasn't really something we had thought about um, in many states. I know that Denver had looked into it for a long time and that there, there just wasn't a lot of information. Um, and now we're really collecting that information as to what is safe to inhale and what is not safe to inhale. Hmm. And then uh, we talked about allergens already, which is a big one. And I think allergens is a lot bigger than um, a, a, a any other labeling um, error, just because with allergens, if you have, let's say, peanuts or some type of allergen in your product and you're not letting your customers know that, it can be very dangerous to consumers who have that allergen. Uh, shelf stability. So this is one that is particular to Colorado. And I know some states are looking into the same type of um, studies and requirements. But in Colorado, they have done recalls and they do enforcement based on the shelf stability of an, a consumable product. And so they want to ensure that the consumable product, if it's being held at room temperature, that's actually safe to be held at room temperature. And when you relate it back to the food industry, the food industry says if you have oil and you add garlic or herbs, unless that has been heated to remove any type of pathogens, it needs to be refrigerated. And in Colorado, the health department takes the same stance in Denver that if you have a cannabis oil um, that has that is made from cannabis plants, botulism is a risk. And the reason for that is botulism is ubiquitous, but it thrives when it's in an anaerobic environment, such as oil, where oxygen can't get to it. And so the concern is if you're not heating that oil to get rid of the potential for botulism spores, or you're not refrigerating that product, it could grow those spores at room temperature. So it's important to make sure that if you have a product held at room temperature, that it is actually allowed to be held at room temperature. Otherwise, it could result in a recall or a hold of your product. Excellent. That's really good input. 
Yeah, absolutely. And then the last one is unapproved facilities. And so this happens when you have a regulator that goes into your facility um, to do an inspection and they find out that your facility is not adequate for making the products that you're making. An example of this is if you're making a consumable product and you don't have running water to wash your hands or to do your dishes, that's not a compliance commercial grade facility. And it actually is putting your products at risk of contamination. Um, and so there have been recalls based on the facility structure alone from lack of water or lack of hand sinks. That, that's an excellent point. And something that we urge our clients to do is if, let's say you're a brand or you're using a manufacturer or you're buying ingredients, and you look at any sort of certifications that they may have, it's important to get them from every single facility that they're operating from and if they move facilities, it needs to start all over again. So I appreciate you making that point. So Kim and Sheila, you guys mentioned you're regulators in the city of Denver. I'm sure have some, some kind of crazy stories about things you've seen. And granted, it's, it's, it's a young industry. Tell us some of the stuff that you saw and maybe some lessons we can take away from this um, for all, all our listeners today. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when I was with the city, um, pesticides were like the really big new thing. Um, I, I don't think that we thought about that when we were writing regulations in the beginning. We didn't even think about, oh, what kind of pesticides people were using and things like that. Um, and it was actually the, the fire department that brought it to our attention um, that Eagle 20, which um, its active ingredient is microbutanol, um, it, you know, was being used. And um, this is a, a really, you know, carcinogenic type of pesticide. Um, you shouldn't be spraying it without the proper PPE. Um, it's really not supposed to be used on anything except for ornamental plants. Um, so like Christmas trees and things like that, bushes, um, and it gets rid of powdery mildew. And as you know, you know, that's a huge issue in the cannabis industry. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we, they, we kind of discovered that people were using this. Um, we also learned that when it combusts, it becomes other things um, in that chemical process. So a lot of people, you know, were smoking this and it was becoming more dangerous, um, you know, than it was originally um, when combusted. So the CDA actually banned the use of Eagle 20 on cannabis, cannabis during the time that I was there. Um, and a lot of, you know, things we had to recall. I mean, I was finding, um, for instance, we went into a place that um, I tested the concentrate. It was just a, a regular like butter or shatter. Um, and it was 56% microbutanol. So you were actually getting more of that toxic chemical in that than you were actual THC um, and other terpenes and things. So it was a really, really big deal back then. I think a lot of the microbutanol use, at least in Colorado, has gone down, um, but that's not the case in other states. So, um, you know, making sure you have accurate COAs and things like that is really, really important that you're testing for these kinds of things. Um, and, you know, just really whatever state or county you're in, um, you know, you can always look to the Department of Agriculture and they should have a list of banned pesticides and pesticides that you are able to use. So to avoid that, um, you know, just use what you're supposed to use. Um, equipment cross-contamination was uh, a really interesting thing that we ran into. Um, and we actually ran into this because of the microbutanol and um, imidacloprid and spiromethacin. So many of those chemicals are... Um, they're chemicals that I would consider very sticky. So they, they stay in things for a very long time. In fact, we would even like swab walls and things like that in facilities. And it would be like living in the, you know, not living, it's not a living being, but um, in the walls and things years okay. after you stopped using it. So um, equipment cross-contamination, we found in extraction, um, if you are not properly cleaning and sanitizing in between um, different, like different growers product, you could potentially be contaminating the next person's product. Um, and we ran into that. We had a huge recall. Um, one of the bigger ones that I did, that that was what was happening. So we, we were following back all the way to the grow of this contaminated product, testing the grow and the grow was clean. And we were like, what is going on? How is that possible? Mm -hmm. Um, and then we found out that what was happening was the extractor was running contaminated product. And then instead of cleaning and sanitizing in between, they would just keep running all the time. So every single thing that they made 
in that facility became contaminated just because of one, one person's grow. Wow. Um, yeah, just because of poor practices. So um, those were the ones that I was really involved with. And um, Sheila has some good stories about the, the next ones. So. Yeah. So um, in Denver, you know, as Kim mentioned, pesticides were a huge issue and were the source of many recalls, um, you know, at the beginning. And then once we really started to get less pesticide recalls and that was really becoming under control because the industry was learning um, from other um, facilities that had had recalls, then we started to experience a lot of elevated yeast and molds um, that would result in recalls. And there was one um, in particular that we really learned a lot. And I think it's important to share just so um, other companies can learn from this and prevent this from happening. And so this particular recall, it started with a complaint that a consumer had reached out to the health department and said they were having adverse health consequences after they had smoked um, certain pre-rolls. And so for the health department, they went out and they took some of these pre-rolls and sent them to a lab for testing, um, testing pesticides, residual solvents, you name it. And what we found was they had very, very elevated yeast and molds, and it was higher than we had really been used to seeing. So during that time, it caused a recall for those pre-rolls and an investigation to determine why were these pre-rolls so elevated with total yeast and molds. What we found out during this investigation was um, that there was a lot of poor practices that were happening within the industry that needed to be addressed. And so what we found out was it is common practice that at dispensaries, when a customer wants to buy a certain strain, they like to evaluate that strain. Sometimes they want to pick it up and look at it um, and smell it to kind of smell those terpenes to see, is this a strain that I want? And this was happening at a dispensary where they had what they called sniff jars, essentially, um, that were little samples of the strain that people could pick up and examine and smell. Um, and what was happening was these sample sniff jars, um, once that strain was sold out, they were all collected and sent back. Then they were combined and ground up to make pre-rolls. So what was happening was this plant material that had been touched by several people, they were in these containers that were probably collecting moisture from people breathing in them. It was creating an environment for yeast and molds to really thrive and start to grow. And so it became, um, you know, something that the health department really worked on is that we need to educate the industry on how to handle these plant materials because contamination is an issue. And even if you don't have yeast and mold problems at the cultivation level, it can become an issue based on how you're handling and, you know, um, handling and using those products or even making them into a different product down the road. So that really was something that we learned a lot from and um, handling procedures became at the forefront of, you know, really educating the industry on that. And also with the same, um, you know, recall, we learned that if you don't have proper curing methods based on your or with your plant material, it can cause yeast and mold problems down the road. If you have moisture content that is at elevated levels, it's going to create an environment where they're longer that that plant sits, um, especially depending on where it's stored and handled, it can grow yeast and molds. So that was a very interesting recall that we were a part of um, and definitely learned a lot. Um, another big recall was related to unapproved additive ingredients. And so this recall was interesting because it wasn't with the biomass of the plant material, it was with edible products. And what we found was that there was edible products that were intended for consumption that had ingredients that were not food grade. And so we found that there was these essential oils being added to this consumable product and for essential oils, they're kind of tricky because some essential oils will say that they're food grade and you can actually consume them. But some essential oils very clearly state on the label that they're not food grade. And that was the case in this situation where these essential oils that were being added to this consumable product clearly stated for aromatherapy use only, which means that they are not approved to be consumed and we don't know if they're even safe to consume. So it really kind of drives home the point that it's really important to be vetting all of your vendors and making sure you do your homework on all of your ingredients because this whole recall could have been avoided had it been a food grade essential oil and had they done their homework to make sure it was food grade and intended for consumption. And then the last one I want to mention to you guys is actually not one that Kim or I was involved in. It was in the state of Utah and it was something that, you know, we heard about from the news. 
Um, and was actually something very shocking that I had never even thought about in the industry, but it shows that, you know, you got to be prepared for anything. <laughs> and what this con or what this recall was, was there was 52 people in the state of Utah that became ill after consuming um, some of the CBD product. And when they went to the hospital, the hospital found that they all tested positive for synthetic CBD that was referred to as 4CCB. Now, the interesting thing with this recall is this company did not advertise that it was synthetic and the consumers were under the impression that they were consuming real CBD. And so it ended up being a huge issue where, you know, it really drives home the point of why testing is so important in the industry and why really regulations are needed. But it also shows that if you are purchasing CBD oil or isolate from another company, um, not only should you be checking that COA to make sure that it is what it says it is, but you should be conducting testing yourself because if they give you something that is a synthetic CBD and you put it into your product, you're now held liable for it. And if there's a recall, it's going to fall on you. So it's important to be testing your ingredients and making sure that what is in your product is actually safe and what it is supposed to be. That's that's a great point, which is if you look at all of these, that they're preventable in some way, right? Perfect segue into how do we prevent these things from happening. Kim, talk a little bit about what we, you know, what the listeners on here can do in order to make sure that these type of major issues don't happen to them. Yeah, so um, this is a really good list of things just to, you know, be aware of. And if you're not, if you don't have procedures in place, um, right now, you probably should think about putting something in place. Um, mm -hmm. Vetting your suppliers is a really huge deal. Um, any type of ingredient that you're buying and putting into your um, products is really important to know where it's coming from and making sure that it's made in a facility that is licensed and is inspected by some kind of local health authority um, or even state health authority or the FDA. Um, making sure that you're vetting, you know, it, that they're a legit company, even doing a site visit. Um, a lot of people will actually hire our company to do third party food safety audits um, in their suppliers facilities, um, especially if they're, you know, doing a CBD supplier or, you know, a THC oil supplier. It's always a good thing to just know where they're at with their food safety um, and make sure that what they're making is, is a safe product. Um, ingredient testing. Um, this is something that actually is required for GMP certification and things like that. Um, you know, testing your ingredients, especially if it's a CBD product or, you know, THC or CBN or CBG, um, making sure that it's tested. Um, I know a lot of times we've run into this issue several times as consultants um, where, you know, they'll come with a COA Mm -hmm. And really, um, that COA is a fake COA. We've had that happen a lot of times in like isolate transactions and things like that. So testing it yourself in house and just making sure that those numbers are lining up um, is always a really good thing. Um, Kim, Kim, you, you literally took the words out of my mouth where we work with a testing company and they've found that some of their COAs have been doctored on the market. And that's why, you know, they're looking at our technology, how to validate the data there. But I'm really glad you brought that up. But just because somebody provides a C of A, you know, that's that's a good start. But doing it in-house is, is absolutely critical. So sorry to interrupt, yeah. but, but that's a good point. No, you're good. Yeah, I it is. It was just really shocking because I, I tend to think that people are overall good and, you know, want to do the right thing and stuff. But, you know, you have to protect your company. Um, and testing in house, you know, it, at least if, uh, the first few times you work with somebody just to make sure that they're following what they should be and they're selling you what they're telling. I mean, we've found um, CBD oil um, that has had really, really high levels of like arsenic and mercury mm. um, that, you know, we're not on the COA and you, you know, you're putting that into a tincture and sometimes giving it to children and things like that. So you just have to really, you know, be cognizant that that can be an issue. Um, and then, and final product testing. So, and, and product testing is what a lot of regulators call it. Um, you know, making sure that when you're testing the the product that is actually going to go to the consumer is really, really important. Um, you know, sometimes if you're testing just the CBD and there's other ingredients, there can be contamination 
um, of other things throughout the process. So testing at the end at that final product is always really important to do just so you know that the things going out the door are good to go and safe for everybody. Um, approved pesticides, we kind of already talked about this, but you know, really pay attention to what pesticides you can use and not use um, and test for those pesticides that are not allowed. Uh, we always recommend this just because we've run into so many issues and so many recalls because of this. Um, you know, just making sure you know what those pesticides are and, you know, what to look for. Um, food grade consumables, obviously, uh, make sure that anything that you're putting into your product is a, a food grade product. So, you know, there are products that are out there, just like Sheila gave a perfect example of essential oils. Um, things like that sometimes are not food grade. They're not made in a facility that is approved by licensed and approved by the FDA um, or the local health departments in the case of ca cannabis. Um, so just really make sure that you know, you know, that everything you're putting in your in your products, including, you know, uh, things that smell good or, you know, cherry flavorings and things like that, that they're actually yeah. food grade. Um, proper labeling. We, we also kind of already touched on that, but, you know, making sure there aren't any claims on your labeling, making sure um, that, you know, the the THC percentage is right or CBD percentage is right. Um, you know, those are the kinds of things that will cause a recall um, to happen. And, you know, if you do have allergens in your facility, you know, we per FDA labeling requirements, you should be putting you know, was made in a facility that has nuts or things like that. So making sure that you're labeling everything correctly is really important. Um, storage and handling. Sheila also gave a really good um, example of this, you know, making sure that anything that you're using is handled and stored correctly in a safe manner um, that cuts down on the amount of cross-contamination. Um, you know, many things in every single facility is entirely different than the next. Um, so, you know, just look around you and be cognizant of like, hey, you know, that whole bag of, of hemp has just been sitting on the floor in this corner and there's water, you know, maybe we should store that in a different place and maybe off the ground. Um, you know, those kinds of things are, are just mm -hmm. really important. Um, cleaning equipment, I, I gave the example of the cross-contamination with equipment. This kind of thing happens all the time. So, you know, really make sure that you're cleaning and sanitizing all of your surfaces and equipment and things like that in between, you know, processes and, and just as often as possible, to tell you the truth. Um, the more clean that your facility is, the, the less likely it is to have cross-contamination issues. Um, track and trace system with batch numbers. Um, to, you know, be honest, there are people out there that do not have a batch number system. Um, and that is terrifying because you, they don't know where their ingredients came from or which batch they were, or, you know, if there was a recall, they wouldn't be able to tell you, um, you know, where things were sold and what items need to be recalled. Um, and when things like this happen, you know, then the regulators have no choice but to, um, you know, have an any and all recall is what they mm. call it but it's pretty much recalling everything that you've ever made in that facility. Um, and it is very damaging to companies. And I think we talk a little bit more about that later. And then mm -hmm. just the facility, um, just like Sheila said earlier, some facilities are not built to make food products. Um, so when you're building your facility or if you're retrofitting your facility, really making sure what the regulations are and making sure you have enough hand sinks and a three compartment sink and a mop sink and making sure they're in the areas that they're supposed to be in um, and making sure you have hot running water and you know things like that that sound like common sense. Um, but believe it or not, I, I would say 80% of the like, CBD facilities that I've been in since being a regulator to do just an FDA audit, um, I, I, if I were an FDA regulator, I probably would have closed them on the spot. Wow. That's how many facilities are not built correctly. So um, just keep that in mind. And, you know, moving forward, those are some really great ways to just prevent recalls from happening. Thanks, Kim. That's awesome. So Sheila, of course, we all hope and wish that a recall and return doesn't take place. But even with a, a company that's doing things the right way, it's still, it still may happen and, and probably likely will happen. What can companies do to kind of prepare 
ahead of time and also anticipate and expect through a recall uh, process uh, that may occur. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it is important to know um, what all a recall entails and how to best prepare for one. It's really important that everybody has a recall plan within their facility that kind of outlines these topics. That way you're prepared if it does happen. It's much easier to be prepared if, an, if a recall does happen than to have to figure out how to do a recall, as, figure it out as you go. So we're going to do a, a, just a walkthrough of what to expect and what you should be preparing for. And the first thing is, you know, the start of a recall. And so oftentimes a recall is based off of a complaint that you receive or identifying a nonconformity that you guys find in the facility yourself, um, realizing that there's contaminated product on the shelves. And sometimes it can even be a regulatory authority that's ordering this recall. Um, so that's kind of generally why they start in the first place. Now, if you have a consumer complaint, um, that reaches out to you that is going to cause a recall or a complaint in general, it's really important to record all the information about the complaint, the details, the complainant's information, because this is all information that you're going to have to relay to your regulatory authority when they ask you. So make sure you guys are documenting all the details of your recalls. The next step is going to be determining the need for a recall. So not all complaints are going to result in a recall and not all nonconformities will. So it's really important to determine if a recall is even needed. And if you determine that, yes, there's contaminated product on the shelves that we need to recall back, then yes, you should definitely conduct a recall. Or if you get orders from your regulatory, regulatory authority, then that's going to determine the need for a recall right there. Uh, the next step is going to be to determine the scope. So who is involved and who needs to be contacted? If you are a manufacturer, if you're wholesale and you are selling products to several storefronts and they have this potentially contaminated product on your shelves, on their shelves, you need to make sure that you have the necessary contact information to contact them to let them know about this recall. Uh, next, you want to make sure that you contact your legal counsel, especially when there is a big recall based on contamination, if the authority is involved, if there's people who have been sick. It's really important that you have um, contacted your legal. Um, contact your regulatory authorities. This is a big one. And I, I really got to stress that it's important that even if the recall is minor and it's not something based off of a huge contamination, it's important to let your regulators know what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. That way, if they need to get involved, that they can. Um, and then the last one is to contact your liability insurance. And we're going to talk about that a little bit further on in the slides. Um, next, determine um, the retrieval method. So how do you plan on getting all this product back to your facility? Are you going to physically go and pick up this product yourself? Do you need to send shipping labels out to have them send it back to you? Uh, next, you're going to initiate the recall. So once you figure out all the different details of how you're going to execute the recall, it's time to initiate it. And so that's going to be notifying customers with possibly contaminated or sus suspect batches and the purchase dates of those batches. This is where it's really important to work with state um, or federal regulators in assisting with this part of the recall. Um, sometimes the, your regulatory authorities are going to have you not only recall directly to the consumers, um, but also do either a press release, whether they need to also um, notify on their website or other methods like that. Um, so it's important to notify the public if it's a class one or class two recall. And just so we're all on the same page, I'm going to explain a little bit about the different classes of recalls. So there are three different classes. The first one, a class one, is if there is reasonable probability that consuming that product will cause an adverse health consequence. Now, that would be like if the product had E. coli or salmonella or could possibly result in death. Um, a class two is where there's a remote probability of an adverse health consequence from consuming that product. And an example of that would be contain a product containing a foreign material such as plastic that could have broken off or glass. And then the third class is going to be um, that consuming the product would not cause an adverse health consequence. And these are more minor. So a minor labeling problem, um, if you don't have an undeclared ingredient other than an allergen, if you do not have an allergen declared, then that would be a class one. But if it's any other ingredient, then that would be a class three. 
Um, and then the next thing is to distribute shipping labors, labels to customers um, so they can send that product back to you. And then I'm going to let Kim take it from here on what to expect next. Cool. I think kind of at a high level, you know, what, what I hear is that it's really important to be um, forthright in these situations. Sometimes things can occur. And I think, you know, companies and business leaders may say, well, maybe we can just cover this up or hide it or try to keep this um, just between us and our buyers. And that to let everybody know early on can certainly take what is a difficult issue and, and, and avoid making it, you know, kind of monumentally large. And, and so I think if there's a problem, one of the things you have to do is conduct an investigation. So Kim, talk a little bit more about what some of the other components are of, of this recall walkthrough process. Yeah. So um, essentially, you know, when I was a regulator, if, if we got a complaint or somebody, you know, made us aware of some reason to go into a facility, that's what we would do was con conduct an investigation. Um, there were times where people wouldn't work with us very well, um, and we would call that hindering an investigation. And I would write people tickets essentially on site that they would have to go to court um, and pay fines and that kind of thing. So, yes, being forthright with your investigators is really, really important. Um, and just, you know, really working with them, give them whatever they need to understand what's going on. Um, and, and a lot of times it will actually save you from, you know, having to um, dispose of everything you've ever made, kind of like I expressed, you know, before. Um, quarantining products. So once products are identified as having an issue or could potentially have an issue, quarantining them is a very important thing to do right away. Um, and labeling them and explaining to your um, employees that they really, you know, to know what to do with those quarantine products. And usually it's don't touch them or use them, leave them in this spot, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, every time we thought that something was or could be potentially contaminated, we would essentially put that on a, on a hold is what we would call it. Um, and it would be in a quarantined area. Nobody was allowed to tamper with it. Usually we put tape around it and signs like stating because if it was contaminated and actually gets out, that's a really big deal. Um, you know, so that was kind of how we dealt with that. Um, then usually we would do laboratory testing of things in the facility, whether that be plants, if it was a grow or, you know, other products that are on the shelves, things like that. Um, we would always do lab testing to see what's contaminated and what's not. Um, then pending those investigation results, um, you know, we would kind of put together a game plan um, and kind of know what our next steps would be in case, you know, it came back uh, like clean test results or not clean test results. You know, we knew exactly what we were going to do next. Um, and usually when we were waiting on those test results, obviously all of that stuff would be on hold um, until those test results came back. And sometimes this can take, you know, depending, um, we had one, uh, one operator um, back in the day um, that we had their entire facility on hold mm -hmm. and we were using testing labs, you know, that were just cannabis testing labs. They didn't believe that the test results were real um, because some of the testing labs at that point, you know, weren't really um, following any guidelines, really. They were just kind of there. So we were getting really varying results from different testing labs. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of it was a pretty big issue at the time. Um, so the CDA started doing testing. Well, unfortunately, you know, they wanted to go with the CDA test results. I said, absolutely. The C CDA came in, took, took samples and left. But the CDA testing lab was so backed up that they didn't get their test results for six months. Wow. Um, and yeah. And that can be really detrimental to, I mean, as you can imagine, if you're not allowed to sell anything for six whole months, um, that's, that's a really big issue and can, you know, put you under. So, and then when we got the test results back, we still had to do the disposal anyway, um, because they were, it was contaminated. Um, and that was from somebody who had bought a grow that was previously, um, contaminated with mycobutanol. So they weren't spraying anything that they weren't supposed to be using. You know, they were doing all their right stuff. They didn't realize that the facility itself was contaminated. So that, I mean, there's just so many weird things that happen. Um, 
and then in, in this case, um, you know, obviously you need to contact your suppliers um, no matter what, if, you know, you're selling to dispensaries or, you know, to the public or to, you know, any storefront, you need to really, you know, let them know what's going on um, and, and make sure that any suppliers of your ingredients, you need to let them know what's going on as well in case it's one of their ingredients that's the reason for the contamination. Um, maintain logs. I, I beat this horse all the dead, dead horse all the time, but mm. everything that you do, regulators will not assume anything. Um, if you tell them, hey, I always do this, that's not proof to them. Your word means literally nothing. The only thing that matters to regulators is proof and data. So if you're keeping and maintaining really good logs of everything that you're doing, um, you know, with dates and actions and communications and all, and the decisions that you've made, um, then you're going to be okay. But if you don't keep any of that, then they're not going to believe you. Um, I, I often um, say, you know, I just feel like everybody always lies to me because as a regulator, everyone does. And so you just don't trust, you can't just trust what anyone is saying. So um, that's unfortunate, but it is true. So just maintain logs of everything you do. Um, and then the clo closure of the recall is when everything is done, everything that needs to be disposed of or not disposed of is disposed of <laughs> um, not or not disposed of. So, you know, everything is done um, and then you kind of get to restart and move forward. Um, and this can be terminated um, when it's determined by the regulatory body or, you know, if you did a voluntary recall because of labeling issues, it's when all of that product has come back or, you know, all of your social media blasts and web, you know, you've done the press release and all of that. So. Excellent. No, that's, that's great. And so, Sheila, give us some tips. Now, products are coming back high level. What are people supposed to do with them, right? Sometimes it may seem, I mean, you guys do this pretty regularly, but um, walk us through that process and what people should do with a return product. Yeah, absolutely. So once you have, you know, conducted the recall and you have all this return product, um, the first thing is important to have a designated area to store all of this product. Now, this area should be labeled um, as to, you know, do not use, this is quarantined, contaminated, however you want to label it and make sure that it's separated from all other ingredients and products to ensure that there's not going to be any mix ups, that your employees are not going to accidentally go over there and grab anything um, to use for production or to sell to, con to consumers. Um, it needs to be very clear that this product is on hold and being quarantined. Um, a big part of that, though, is the storage. So if you have a special quarantine area, it's important to make sure that, you know, rate the same storage applies for this product than all of your other products. So you still want to make sure that it is stored off the ground, that it's protected from contamination. We don't want to have anything uncovered that would attract pests or anything like that. And the reasoning for that is if this product is under investigation, you don't want to add any more to the contamination. And even if it's not under investigation, let's say that it was just a minor recall based off of improper um, labeling and that it can easily be corrected and sent back to stores. You don't want to contaminate that product so it can no longer be reworked and sent back up to stores. So make sure that this quarantine area is properly stored. And then you want to make sure that you keep all of this product in the quarantine area until you have approval from your local authorities, especially if the authorities were the ones who told you to do the recall or if they have been involved in the recall, it's really important that you get approval from them before you release anything. Um, the reason for that is if you're gonna be sending stuff back out to consumers, your regulatory authorities wanna make sure that the um, recall has been remediated, that any contamination has been corrected. I um, mean, even if you're, your, if you decide to dispose of this product because it's contaminated, mm -hmm. oftentimes your regulators need to have oversight. Um, the cannabis industry is an interesting industry where cannabis is not federally legalized. And so there needs to be oversight oftentimes and proof of proper disposal. And we've heard several times that during recalls of stuff that was supposed to be disposed of, it's sneaking out the back door. And so right. a lot of regulators, it's important to them that they can visually see the disposal and that you have disposed of this product and it's not going to be leaving your facility and potentially going to consumers. Um, and then the last... 
Yeah. And then the last thing to mention is to just document, um, especially, you know, to give proof to your regulatory authority, document the quantity, how the product was handled, if customers were refunded. This is all stuff that you probably want to keep on site anyway for your personal records for your company. But anything that is returned, it's important that you really have documentation of that and proof of that. You know, what, what you guys talk about is, you know, there's complexity in knowing where your product came from, who, you know, specifically who is the supplier, what's their location, what type of equipment did they use, what type of testing they did to do, what you did in your facility, where did it go? That all fits into traceability. Talk a little about, Sheila, why traceability is so important in this industry. Yes, I really, really stress how important traceability is when it comes to recalls. It will be a lifesaver. It'll make your recall so much easier and can make it far less detrimental to your company. And so an example I like to use is, you know, let's say if we had a, a company, a manufacturing company, and they had purchased CBD isolate. And during a routine inspection, we were we found that this isolate may not have been from an approved supplier. Um, we couldn't find proof of the license of that supplier, if they were regulated. We had no idea where this isolate came from. And so as regulators, we told the manufacturing company, we said, okay, anything that has this batch number of CBD isolate needs to be put on hold um, and it could potentially lead to a recall until we figure, further investigate and find things out. Unfortunately, this company did not have proper traceability. They were not able to trace back where all their ingredients came from, which is why we could not figure out where the CBD isolate came from, and that they were not able to trace forward as to where product went after that, what ingredients were in what products. They could not identify to us which of their products had that specific CBD isolate in it. Now, in that situation, if your regulator cannot determine which products have that potentially unapproved isolate, then they're going to assume that all of your products have that isolate. And so mm -hmm. the recall went, it could have been something very small and a small portion of their products. And then it ended up being an any and all recall, which that means anything and everything that was ever produced in that facility is now being recalled because they didn't have proper traceability or batch records to prove which of their products had this isolate. And so this recall ended up being far larger than it really should have been and far more detrimental to the company just because they could not have, or they did not have proper traceability methods in place. Wow, that's pretty significant. So, so Kim, at a high level, I guess, you know, smaller companies may be using spreadsheets, bigger companies may be using something else. Kim, how have you seen CBD and hemp companies using good systems and technology in order to help impact the, you know, accurate data and records, as well as impact the speed and accuracy of a recall. Yeah. So, I mean, this is something that I always say, you know, don't ever be against regulators. I mean, I understand that people are people and some people just have personalities that you don't like and things like that. But working with your regulators is the best thing you can do in these situations. Just, you know, being very honest and, and, getting things to them as quickly as possible. Nobody, you know, I don't care who you are. Um, nobody likes to have a regulator in their facility. And there are times, you know, or there were times that, you know, I was in the middle of a recall and I would be spending several days with these people because it took so long for them to get, you know, their information to me. Um, cause the regulator will show up and ask you for things and then they just hang out in your facility the whole day sometimes, um, until you can get those kinds of things to them. Um, and when you have a, a system, you know, very similar to the one that you have, um, it, you know, it is so much easier to be able to trace and track and get that information to them really quickly. You know, there were times that somebody who had a really, really great system set up, you know, even if it was just an Excel spreadsheet, because it was a very small company, um, it was great because I would just be there and be like, oh, great, I have the information I need. These are the things that need to be quarantined, we'll be in touch. And I would just leave, you know, instead of just like being there all day, not only as a regulator, they don't want to be there all day, trust me, um, but the less that you can have them in your facility, honestly, the better. Um, you know, and it's really impressive too. you know, hey, look what I have already. We're following this. We trace this. You know, it makes them think, oh, no, these guys really know what they're doing. Um, and it's it's always impressive.
that that's that's really good input. And and when we look at this, you know, this this chart, it talks about, you know, you can see really how complex the C, you know, the hemp to CBD supply chain can actually be. There's a lot of handling, a lot of data that should be passed from one step to another. You guys have given great examples or, or horrifying examples of all the things that potentially could go wrong. Being able to ideally identify them before something goes bad. But if something does go bad, how to go back and find out what that source is can alleviate a lot of pain. And so integrating tech traceability is such an important part of not just this industry, but also the food industry. And, and Frank Giannis, who's the FDA de deputy commissioner, who's we've been in touch with, you know, his quote is tech enabled traceability is part of our future. It's something that we want to integrate. And so what Tag One has done is given our partners and customers the capability to capture information at the farm level migrate that over to the enterprise to connect all of your um, you know your documentation your buyer suppliers locations as well as to empower the consumers and buyers to know where that came from and so so three key components that are relevant to this conversation is one having data immutability meaning you know we use blockchain how do you know that the information put in there is accurate and 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 also up to speed and also connected which is having a single system that pulls all this together. And ultimately that's going to lead to you know, food security or CBD security. So that's something that, that you know, we want to do to help, help our clients along the way. So real quick, another poll we're going to push out just to get a sense of what everybody's thoughts are. You know, how do, important do, does everybody think that um, a system can, can be to help manage the re recall process? And is that something that, that you guys are looking at or, or, or is important? I will give it another quick second and we'll grow from there. It looks like it's pretty important here. So 4.6, 5 being, of course, very important and, and, and a 1 being not very important. And, and we had nobody less than a 3, which I think is is a good sign, right? At least I, I guess it, it's somewhat of a, you know, my 13-year-old daughter has me helping her with, with data. I know that if you're on this call, it means you already are interested in, in how this works, and which is a good sign. But... You know, I think that's something that we need to evangelize to the rest of the industry. And so um, one thing that we like to do and recognize, and Kim and Sheila have hinted on it, is you know, it's what you do at the beginning and the little things you do right as far as capturing master data and tracking your transaction is going to really help prevent some of these issues. Um, Kim, talk a little bit about what regulators may require during an investigation um, and, and, and what, in, like how long investigations may occur and, and what they can expect, um, in, when you guys are going in and into a different facility. Yeah. So, um, it really depends on the company. Um, like I said, there, we had some investigations that went, you know, eight months long. Um, and a lot of times that was due to the, to the lack of data that they had and the lack of documentation and things like that. Um, but, you know, some of them, we would walk in and things would be ready and we could identify exactly what the contaminated product was um, right away, which is always really nice. Usually also they're going to ask you um, for samples of the product as well. So being ready to, to identify, OK, this is the batch that we think is contaminated. This one also could be contaminated. Um, you know, and then they'll probably choose a few and then they'll probably choose one that they think is not contaminated as well. Because sometimes in wholesale food manufacturing, batches get mixed up and things like that. Um, and especially in the cannabis industry, if there are no data stating like where things are going and what ingredients were used in what, um, th then yeah, we're going to, we're going to sample almost everything. I mean, I remember, um, <laughs> being in these giant grow rooms um, where they, you know, they didn't have any data at all. And that means that I had to crawl and take samples of, you know, a hundred plants in each giant grow room. And they had like 44 grow rooms. I mean, I was there every single day for like a month straight, just taking wow. samples. Yeah. And, and that's what you run into. It's like, if they have no data or don't know what's going on, you know, and it, it, where it happens um, and it makes for very long days. Um, and it really is terrible for the operator because then they have a regulator in their facility for a whole month, essentially, every single day. 
Um, and, you know, employees are nervous and they don't know what's going on. And, it, you know, and it just, it happens. So, you know, having some kind of documentation on where things are going and what you're using, you know, obviously in grows, you're supposed to have spray logs. It's a requirement of the MEG in Colorado. You know, every single um, regulatory body has spray logs, right? And it's required. But you would be shocked. You would be shocked to, to see how many people don't have that. Um, and, and also in the hemp and CBD side, you know, that's, that's a fairly unregulated um, sector. So, you know, they don't have regular regulators that are going in and telling them what they have to have and what they need to do. Um, and right now, you know, the FDA regulations and the USDA regulations just came out, but the FDA regulations we're still waiting for. Um, and I, I guarantee in those regulations, they will have something about traceability. So, yep. you know, for this exact reason. Yeah, I think that in the September, the FDA is supposed to be putting out some more information on traceability. And that's really why, you know, you know, we feel that, you know, whether you use our system or a homemade system or somebody else, just making sure that your, you know, the data you're capturing is accurate, right? And, and so I, I kind of look at two main components, which is knowledge, knowing what to collect and then discipline, making sure you do that. And, and having a good system will sometimes remind you, hey, don't forget to put this in as well as give the discipline and analytics to make sure everybody's following things the right way. But putting in accurate data, um, making sure that you put in when you receive ingredients, from whom, are they approved, and being able to make sure you don't lose visibility from a lot or batch number as it goes through a blend or transformation and you have a new lot number created in your own facility. So historical spreadsheets have made that very difficult. And I think that's what we've developed in tag one here. You can see what we call our visual map. So you can click on different icons. This is good for me. I'm a crayon guy. I like to look at pictures. Hey, let me see who the supplier is. Let me see their documentation. What was the transaction number? When was it shipped? What's the expiration? All in one centralized platform just alleviates a lot of potential mistakes here, which theoretically should make these audits in the certification process go a whole lot smoother, as well as making sure that the right people on your team, the quality assurance person is working, you know, there's a workflow set in place so that the right people are taking the right actions at the right time, um, which ultimately is going to have a surgical uh, supply chain system making sure you don't end up in a, a potentially disastrous recall um, process. So, you know, one thing that um, we developed in TAG1 with this integrated supply chain is a recall and return system. And so having that built in already allows you to create templates with the different classes, right? Class one, class two, and class three with various um Verbiage is all already in there, and, and Sheila talked about those different classes. Um, and then also having the ability to say, hey, we know this lot number from this supplier needs to go on a recall. Having an integrated system, you already know who's received that. So it should make it very simple. Having the template automatically email out who those who the buyers are, because you'll have your buyers input into the tag one system already. And then from there tracking what you received and when. And so by having all of this in one centralized system, the intent is, you know, knowing every step of the way where everything is at, also giving your partners, like regulators, like your insurance providers, like your executive team, um, visibility on what's happening. Nobody's in the dark and you're not rummaging through paper to try to pull that together. Um, so that way audits are, are just a whole lot easier and the process is much, much faster. So last poll, we've, we've covered a lot and we've got a couple more slides too. But after hearing this, how prepared do you feel you, your company is, or your clients, if you're getting your insurance or, or, or lawyer are for a recall and return? With a one star being you're not prepared at all and a five, hey, we, we feel like we have this down pretty good. Give you guys a second to do this and we'll show the results. And we'll wrap this up and get to some questions. All right, I appreciate everybody's honesty. We'll push this out here. So we're right around in the middle. Like we're about 3.2. We got five people who says they're right there and, 
And most people are kind of at the two and three star, which isn't surprising. This is a lot to learn. It's a new industry. So I appreciate everybody's feedback. All right. So next next thing is, you know, our friend at McLaren's um, Insurance have are, are, are looking to provide um, services to hemp and CBD providers. And they, and they shared some information I thought was important to put on here because it's relative to recall and return that was enlightening to me. So the one, which is knowing, A, do you have insurance? And then making sure you have the right insurance. So a lot of us just assume, hey, product liability insurance, I'm covered, right? If there's a problem or somebody gets sick, and I get sued, you're covered. That is correct. But what's not covered that Sheila and Kim talked about is if you have to dispose of that product and it's millions of dollars, that you're not covered. So just make sure that you contact your insurance provider. And this is a relatively new industry. So our folks at, at McLaren's um, are, are, are a company you can reach out to. There's other, other ones out there um, that can provide you input. But you know, Kim had told me before and Sheila had talked about their companies that went out of business because they didn't have the right insurance or, or they didn't have the right process because of a recall and return. So just make sure you do your diligence on the side and are protect yourself. So Kim, can you just wrap this up for us? Just give us a high level overview on what some of these common mistakes are um, and then we'll get to Q&A. Yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously I, I feel like I'm just kind of repeating this stuff that I already went over with this list. But, you know, if you take anything away from this, this, these are the kind of talking points that I feel like you should pay attention to. So just being prepared, um, you know, realizing that, you know, if you're a CBD or a hemp company, um, that the FDA is, is starting to write regulations right now. Um, and understanding what their wholesale food regulations and supplement regulations that already exist are, um, you should be able to get your facility into compliance with those regulations because they're not going to reinvent the wheel. Um, the FDA knows food safety and they know product safety. Um, CBD has a few nuances that they'll have to you know, write some certain things into. But for the most part, it's all going to be the same. Um, so, you know, getting prepared now, having a, a batch number system, doing all that stuff now is going to save you so much time and stress and money down the line because it's coming. Um, it doesn't seem like it's coming very quickly, but it is. Um, and then not communicating um, is a huge mistake um, in this industry, you know, to your staff, you know, training them individually you know, communicating how things work to buyers, local jurisdictions, um, so like your local or and state health department, and to the FDA. I mean, right now, you know, they're not very involved, but they're about to be very, very involved. So a huge mistake is not communicating with those people um, when something does happen. It, um, it not can. having a CAPA, CAPA plan, so corrective action, preventive action plan, um, and a consumer complaint SOP. So those Two things are very, very important. Um, actually, in the marijuana world, the, the THC cannabis world, um, many jurisdictions actually require you to have a CAPA plan. Um, they're kind of complicated to put together, but you know they, they're really great to have. It essentially tells your staff exactly what to do when there is a complaint or when there is you know, something wrong with the product or it's labeled wrong. It, it just helps you. Um, correct what is wrong with the product and prevents it from happening again. So that's essentially what a CAPA plan is. Um, not vetting suppliers. Um, you know, that we, I seriously talk about this all the time. If you're buying an ingredient from a supplier, you need to vet them. You need to know what is going on in their facility, if they have a food safety plan, if they have a CAPA plan, if they're following you know, basic food safety guidelines, because it's not them that is on the recall. It's going to be your brand and company name. So you need, it's up to you to know what's going on in those facilities, whether that be a third party audit um, or, you know, going and visiting the facility yourself um, and see, just seeing, you know, what is going on um, and knowing what, what you're buying and the, what you're buying, you know, with the testing and things like that, making sure that what you're buying is actually what you're buying, um, what you think you're buying. So 
um, not conducting mock recalls ahead of time. This is a huge, huge issue. When we do GMP certification, it's actually required for those companies to do mock recalls, I think once a year at least. Um, we always recommend you know, going up to the shelf, wherever it may be, grabbing a product off of that shelf and pretending like that product is contaminated. Finding out where it's been sold, what ingredients are in it, you know, choose a fake, you know, one of the ingredients, like pretend that it's contaminated and then walking through what to do in that instance. And in, in that scenario, it really is a great way to train your staff. Um, you know, all of your staff should know how to do a recall um, and having a really good recall SOP. Also, um, I'm just throwing that in there. It's a good idea as well. Um, not having a designated team that's responsible for recalls and for, you know, your food safety and things like that. Um, that is also required um, per GMP usually is having at least someone that's in charge of it all. Um, but, you know, having a team that's specially trained on food safety or recalls is a really, really great idea. Um, and it gives them some responsibility and they can, you know, really pitch in and help. Um, and then all of it doesn't just fall onto the owners or, you know, whatever. So it's just really effective. Um, not having product liability insurance. We, you know, we've been, we just talked about this. Um, it is a really big deal. If you don't have insurance, your company might not last. Um, and it is a really important thing to have. So um, we always recommend that. And not having legal guidance. So LA Consulting, you know, we know a whole lot of stuff, but we are not lawyers. And you really should have great legal guidance if you are in this industry. Um, not only, you know, is it very complicated and the laws are very strange, but, um, you know, having someone that you can trust that you can go to and ask, hey, what should I do? What should I do in this instance is always really, really great. So we always recommend um, having, you know, good legal guidance. Um, not putting your customer first. So if you're out there just to make a quick buck, um, you know, that's one thing. But if you're in this because you love it and because you care about, you know, the people that you're giving this to, you should think about them first um, and should have food safety plans and GMP certification and CAPA plans and, you know, all of this stuff in place because really it's about them. Um, and you don't want to make anyone sick. It's, you know, that's a terrible thing um, when it happens. And, you know, you should be doing everything that you can to prevent it. Um, and then not having a track and trace method. Um, we, I mean, I literally talked about this the whole time. It is a terrible thing to walk into a place and have no data and not know what's going on or where things are going. I mean, it will cause major ruin to your company if you don't have something in place. And then not leveraging technology. I mean, I think that this is just, you know, we live in a time where everything can be, is technologically advanced and you can use it. And if you aren't using it, it's not only, you know, an issue with, um, you know, not having things in place, but it's also, you know, it slows down your company. Um, you know, the more you can leverage technology, the more fluid and responsive, responsive and, you um, just reliable it, it is. So just, you know, keep that in mind. Yep. That's really good summary, Kim. And I think we also look at what are the benefits of technology, which ultimately it's going to save you a lot of time and a lot of extra personnel that are needed just for shuffling paper um, could certainly prevent some different issues that can cost millions of dollars. So the investment is pretty minor for the ultimate results. So um, let's go to quick, uh, actually, let me, Give a quick summary here, then we'll do some Q&A because I know we, we ran over a little bit, but this was fantastic. So if you want to get in touch with Kim and Sheila, their emails are here. You can also visit them at laconsulting.com. And also my email and direct phone number on here as well, joe.witty at tag1.com. Um, I will share this with you guys afterwards, but just appreciate everybody for joining us today. We got um, 